Hey, it's Mike here, and today did Dr. Eckberg just prove that butter is healthy by eating 10 tablespoons of butter for 10 days and then doing his blood work? Well, based off how many times that video has been sent to you guys as proof that butter is healthy and that everybody should just quit their vegan diets to eat butter, a lot of people are convinced. From now on, it's just gonna be pats of butter everywhere. Pat yourself on the back, pat yourself on the face, everywhere, butter's back. And it's literally on your back. I don't know where I'm going. The point is that people seem to be especially persuaded because of those blood numbers that he did. He ate all that butter and things didn't seem to get worse. Some things seem to even get slightly better. This is me loading up on butter at the grocery store because in the next 10 days, I'm gonna eat 100 tablespoons of butter to see what all the saturated fat will do to my blood. So we're gonna investigate this and spoiler alert, he left out what is probably the most important blood marker. And then in terms of those other blood markers seem to have maybe hacked them a little bit to make people think butter was healthy. And so we're gonna compare his results to a large body of peer reviewed research, which is better than an N of one, a single person's anecdotal results over 10 days. Anyway, let's just go. For those that didn't see my response video to his game changers attack, Dr. Ekberg is a Swedish doctor with over 2 million subscribers. He is a low carber and he is wildly popular being a doctor telling you to eat more animal fat. People eat it up just like how they want to eat up all that high calorie animal fat. And this is the same guy from this video who thinks class 1A carcinogens, bacon and sausage are top health foods you must eat. 900,000 views. What the heck, Berg? And yes, that is from 2022. That's his current view. Here's the butter video itself, which of course got quite a few views. And while he says, oh, you, you shouldn't eat as much butter as I'm eating here, he's clearly setting out to make butter look healthy. I believe that was the design from the very beginning as a part of this whole low carb narrative. And yes, 10 tablespoons is a lot of butter. We're talking about a thousand calories of butter per day. Looking to chronometer, that's about 71 grams of saturated fat. Again, dairy is already the main source of saturated fat in the US diet, at least. Actually, five grams of trans fat as well, which is horrid, and I don't think anybody can defend that. <laughs> He then said he added meat on top of that butter for the rest of his diet. So the saturated fat grams is probably through the roof here. Definitely higher than the USDA's recommendation of less than 10% of total calories from saturated fat or the American Heart Association's five to 6% of total calories. Then I ate eight times as much as I was supposed to. Again, nothing I recommend, but those are health authorities trying to keep the little man down. You gotta capitalize on all that distrust and authority and also tell them a bunch of good news about their bad habits. That's how you succeed on YouTube nowadays. <laughs> Especially when that authority is telling you to eat less fried chicken and less ice cream. Anyway, the first like 20 minutes of this video is him talking about general blood lipid sort of facts and properties with a low carb slant, of course, and we'll cover a little bit of that but in the spirit of just getting right to the results, which he did not, here are some of his results. The first one we'll cover is triglycerides, and he really puts an emphasis on this one as kind of like the smoking gun that it's healthy because, oh, high fat foods are supposed to raise your triglycerides, but here are his results. Started off at 56, and after eating butter, after stuffing my bloodstream with saturated fat for 10 days, it was at 54. What, his triglycerides actually went down a little bit? This is a miracle, holy cow lactation spread. Amazing results. But I think this was a bit tricksy here because not only would you probably not expect a massive rise in just 10 days in triglycerides, but the main concern here could be the spike in triglycerides after eating a high fat meal, especially with a bunch of butter. We're talking about that postprandial or after meal lipemia or fatty blood. And it appears he looked at fasting triglycerides, which are of course gonna be low before you eat anything, but we have to look at the potential dangers of those after meal spikes of fat. And a classic study here on angina or chest pain in people with heart disease really emphasizes that. Now people were given a high animal fat meal and then they waited hours measuring the lactescence or milkiness of your blood, which is really a marker of how much fat like triglycerides are building up in your blood. And a few hours into it, 
X marks the spot for chest pain in those people. And so this is where you're getting those after meal holiday heart attacks from eating all of things like butter and fat. It's not good. Here's a newer one. Eat a high fat meal and you see a spike in triglycerides. That's what this chart is. Yeah, you can measure fasting triglycerides at the beginning there and they would be really low. Heck, measure them at the end when it goes down. You could say nothing happened but we had this major spike that would be missed. Also, cool fact, this was actually a study about strawberries and their antioxidant effect. So they gave people high fat meals with or without strawberries and the strawberries blunted oxidized LDL, which is awesome. However, you know, it was funded by Big Strawberry, so take it with a grain of salt. It is in line with other berry oxidization studies, but all of this information about boosts in triglycerides after eating and its potential danger is why from this study they say, quote, Evidence suggests that non-fasting triglycerides, i.e. measured within eight hours of eating, better predict cardiovascular disease than fasting triglycerides. But it is the case that you know, short-term consumption of high saturated fat might not raise fasting, again, just fasting triglycerides from this randomized control trial. Yeah, even the butter group here didn't see a rise in triglycerides. However, this brings us to the most important point. They did see a statistically significant increase in LDL or bad cholesterol. However, for some suspicious reason, Dr. Eckberg decided not to share or measure his LDL cholesterol levels after this experiment. We don't want to focus on LDL by itself. We want to understand healthy versus unhealthy LDL, but the number itself means very, very little. And it is not about how much saturated fats you eat. This is really sketchy and it's the most important marker here. We're talking about the one that, according to the European Society of Cardiology, is causally linked to atherosclerosis unequivocally. And a quick reminder from this meta-analysis of nearly 400 controlled feeding trials, increasing saturated fat consumption increases cholesterol. So clearly the result would have been an increase for him. And he's either hiding it, somehow thinks it's not important, or I don't know what's going on. And it's weird because he actually does talk about LDL in the video, sort of starting to justify high levels despite not sharing his levels. Of course, using the large fluffy LDL is less dangerous or actually good argument. And this is a large fluffy LDL. This is what they're supposed to be. But as we know from this study, it is still associated with an increased heart disease risk. However, just slightly less than the small LDL, not even that different. It's a total bogus claim to say that it's harmless. To emphasize how bad he is on this topic, going to another video of his where he looks at the before and after of a patient who went on a low carb diet, whose cholesterol goes from like 300 to about 300, but he says it's, it's an improvement because some of his LDL got a little larger and fluffier. So you're wondering, why am I bragging about this case? It just doesn't look too hot. I mean, this guy is in trouble, right? So now we look at the small LDL count, and that went from 1653 to 1227. No, the amount of crappy small LDL that would still be there would be lethal, even if LDL that is fluffy is good for you. A way better solution would have been to put that patient on a plant-based diet in which they would see a total lowering of their LDL as vegans, for example, average ideal LDL at about less than half of what that guy had. His LDL was what? His LDL was 225. A lot of vegans tend to be between 50 and 70. So my guess is that Eckberg's LDL or bad cholesterol levels were just too high for him to have to explain away for another 20 minutes. So he just left them out. I have no idea, shot in the dark there. But this brings me to you know a study that I think is interesting that I haven't talked about that demonstrates that you know numbers aside, we can look at cardiovascular disease outcomes and saturated fat consumption. And that brings us to the Finnish mental hospital study that was done in the very late 70s. This is really interesting because they had two hospitals, one that was going to just start out with a normal higher saturated fat 
finished diet, and the other that was put on a lower saturated fat diet. And then after six years, the two hospitals switched so that the one that was eating high saturated fat is now eating a low saturated fat, and the one that was eating low is now eating high. And the results in terms of heart disease mortality were that during the low saturated fat periods, these mental hospital subjects had about half the rate of heart disease death. And finally, they say that there are no confounders that could possibly explain this difference. So pretty powerful stuff, you know, not the perfect randomized control trial, but amazing. And I wanted to mention it because I haven't mentioned it before. And finally, it's hard to just redo studies like this because they're not really considered ethical anymore, especially when we know the results are gonna be like this, where you're gonna have more people dying. However, somehow it is still ethical to just feed all of these patients a high saturated fat diet, standard American diet anyway. Ethics are complicated. Another result that I think a lot of people were persuaded by, which is interesting because you don't hear a lot of people just randomly testing it on YouTube, and that is insulin resistance as measured by HOMA. H-O-M-A, insulin resistance, that stands for homeostasis model assessment of insulin resistance. And I started out at 0.82, and after 10 days of eating butter, I was down to 0.58. Even though we're supposed to increase insulin resistance, with saturated fat. And it's really an approximation of insulin resistance that is convenient in contrast to the very non-convenient gold standard known as hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp. If it involves a clamp, you probably don't want it and it's probably not as easy as just taking a proxy measurement for insulin resistance, which is what HOMA insulin resistance measures. In fact, it's really just a formula, and this is the formula. You know, it's not measuring your cell's actual insulin sensitivity. The formula is just fasting insulin multiplied by fasting glucose divided by 22.5 the magic insulin number. Now, I do think it is a really good way to approximate insulin resistance in normal people eating normal diets, you know, normal macronutrient ratios, actually consuming some carbohydrates, but in Ekberg's situation, he is not eating in a normal scenario. You know, if you use a little bit of math, it's clear that if you are able to just either lower your fasting insulin or your fasting glucose, you will improve this number. And it is the case that he likely swapped out some protein for butter fat there and protein increases insulin as this study and a ton of other studies mention. might as well cite one. So he essentially used his macronutrient ratio to hack this approximation of insulin resistance, which is really ironic and Kind of messed up considering that the ingredient he added saturated fat is causally implicated in insulin resistance itself. You know, through mechanisms that I have entire videos on, high saturated fat can lead to toxic ceramide creation, which can lead to insulin resistance. As this review, which is not one guy eating butter for a week and a half states, quote, epidemiological evidence and intervention studies clearly show that in humans, saturated fat significantly worsen insulin resistance, well, monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fatty acids improve it. Yeah, saturated fat causes insulin resistance. He just used one proxy marker to manipulate the numbers. And I wanted to give you an actual intervention example of this, which brings me to this study, which is quite interesting. It's from 2018, feeding study in diabetes care, which states saturated fat is more metabolically harmful for the human liver than unsaturated fat or simple sugars. Quite a claim. They took 38 people that more or less met the standard American profile. They split them up into three groups, all of them overfed by a thousand calories, one group overfed with saturated fat, one with unsaturated fat, and one with simple sugars. They did it for three weeks, and while it's not the biggest study in the world, yeah, it's still over twice as long and 38 times as big as Ekberg's study. Um, but the results are quite interesting. First of all, we have that, yes, their liver fat, which is what they were interested in here, went up in the saturated fat group only. And this is specifically a measurement of triglycerides in the liver. So yeah, those spikes from eating saturated fat after meals are adding up and going somewhere that you don't want it to. We also have a 10% rise in LDL or bad cholesterol in the saturated fat group only. And they also looked at insulin resistance using that same marker, HOMA insulin resistance, and found that in the saturated fat group only, it went up by 23%. 
You know, in this case where people are actually eating all of the macronutrients, this is a more acceptable use of that marker. But perhaps most importantly, quote, the saturated fat group induced insulin resistance and endotoxemia, which is bacterial endotoxins, likely from animal fat, and significantly increased multiple plasma ceramides. Yes, those ceramides that I was talking about that are toxic, that can be derived from saturated fat, actually measurably increased by 50% in three weeks on the saturated fat group only. Which they say is also a risk factor for a cardiovascular disease, of course, other than the diabetes issue. And they say that their findings were consistent with studies showing an equal calorie replacement of saturated fat with unsaturated fat improves insulin resistance and large studies showing that, hmm, rich saturated fat foods like butter increase the risk of type two diabetes. And this is the concern is that a lot of people will watch these videos and they're watching him kind of going low carb and eating a ton of butter and these things and making their insulin response worse, their insulin sensitivity might go down and they might even have a good insulin resistance number, but if they return to a normal eating pattern, which virtually all of them do and includes some carbs, then they're gonna be met with the surprise of insulin resistance, unexpected, ouch. Now that's probably just one reason that meta-analyses show over and over again that low carb diets are associated with about a 30% increased risk of all cause mortality, just all of these negative health effects stacking up. And all these low carb people make it seem like they're presenting some new type of a low carb diet, but he's still just telling people to eat the same foods that is Atkins dieters and these people with that increased mortality ate, we're talking about more butter, more eggs, more meat. There's nothing new here. In the end, Ekberg is just a master peddler of good news about your bad habits. And he's a doctor and he actually even presented some blood results here showing that butter made him healthier. But as we know, these are quite clearly misleading. One, his triglyceride numbers completely miss what is likely massive postprandial or after meal spikes in blood fat that of course have their own risks and have been proposed as a better measure of cardiovascular disease risk than fasting levels. He also didn't show his LDL, bad cholesterol, which is the most important marker that is causally linked to atherosclerosis, to heart disease, and his large fluffy LDL claims are just BS. That's all there is to it. And in terms of his HOMA insulin resistance measurement, it really is just saying that he was able to get either his insulin or his glucose down probably by eliminating protein, just manipulating his macronutrient ratios and leading people to believe that he would have a better ability to fight diabetes, well, no, not the case. Especially when you consider, once again, that saturated fat is very likely a main cause of insulin resistance that is perhaps leading to this epidemic. I mean, vegans, as I always say, eat more carbohydrates and their total risk of diabetes is like 75% lower from the Adventist studies. So go figure. Finally, to be a vegan here, the animals and the planet just do not need people to eat more butter. And for vegetarians out there that don't wanna be involved in the killing of animals, uh, yeah, the dairy industry is the meat industry. It just had to echo that. Anyway, let me know down below what you think about all of this. Are there any points that I missed or anything that needs to be clarified? And of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.